Welcome to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 4 section of the Abdomen, our Lecture 5 on the Stomach and Duodenum. So the stomach is a very important GI organ. It is located between the esophagus and duodenum and is pivotal in aiding the bulk of dietary breakdown. It is a highly acidic environment that helps by secreting hydrochloric acid to help degrade the food bolus. It helps prepare this food bolus for further digestion by also secreting some digestive enzymes. The next segment of the GI tract is the duodenum. The duodenum is the first section of the small intestines and is yet a short but very important structure because it is pivotal for proper digestion as well as normal GI physiology because it is a very important site for digestive enzyme secretion. So we'll first discuss the anatomy of the stomach. So the stomach is a J-shaped or hook-shaped organ that allows for large volume expansion during food consumption and also contains numerous dense folds inside the surface area. It is located in the abdominal cavity and has what we call a greater and lesser curvature. It is located in the upper midline abdomen and its location can vary whether it's on the right or left hypochondriac region. The location of the stomach is important because in relation to pain, it can cause some confusion. Whether the pain is from gastric ulceration, gastric malignancies, or any other infections, it can be confused with pancreatic pain, gallbladder pathology, or even biliary pathology. So when we talk about the greater curvature, the greater curvature is on the, is on the convex side of the stomach. It is on the outside angle and it's very close to the pancreas. It extends from the cardia and it goes all the way around into the pylorus. It is supplied by the short gastric, the left and right gastropiploic arteries, and it's very important because it's the site of attachment for the greater omentum. On the other side is the lesser curvature, on the concave side of the stomach, that is very close to the inside angle and close to the liver. It extends again from the cardia to the pylorus, covers a much shorter distance, but it is supplied by the left and right gastric arteries. And it's also important because it's the site of attachment for the lesser omentum. So when we talk about the components of the stomach, the very first component of the stomach is the cardia. It is continuous with the esophagus at the lower esophageal sphincter. It's a very short segment. The next section is the fundus, which is the most superior portion of the stomach. It lies above the cardia and really kind of has a minor role or almost no really significant role in digestion. Now the most important or the largest portion of the stomach is the antrum. This is where there's numerous dense rugae or stomach folds that help with the majority of gastric acid secretion. At the very distal end of the stomach is a region called the pylorus, which contains the pyloric sphincter and is continuous with the duodenum. Again, these very dense, numerous ridges or folds on the antrum of the stomach help to increase the number of surface area for secretion of gastric juices. When we talk about the stomach and the esophagus, it's also important to talk about the lower esophageal sphincter. This sphincter is located at the very beginning or entrance way into the stomach, right around T11. It is a physiological sphincter, and what that means is that it has no specific muscles dedicated towards its contraction. And because of this reason, it's often a site of pathology, ranging from hiatal hernias to achalasia. Hiatal hernias meaning increased laxity in the tightness of the sphincter, which can cause what we call GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease or achalasia, in which there's excess contraction in the lower esophageal sphincter, and it fails to allow for food bolus or even liquids to pass through into the stomach. On the other end of the stomach is what we call this pyloric sphincter, and this is the entrance way from the stomach into the duodenum in an area called the pylorus. This, however, is not a physiological sphincter. This is an anatomical sphincter. This has specific muscles that help with the sphincter contraction. And the pyloric sphincter is a tonically contracted, meaning it's always contracted portion of the stomach, and only relaxes when the pressure inside the stomach gets to such a high degree that the actual will push the contents past the sphincter, aiding in the release of gastric contents. Occasionally, especially in newborns, you can get a pyloric stenosis, in which the pyloric sphincter, the pylorus region of the stomach, is actually stenotic or closed off. And what happens is these children will present very early on in infancy with projectile non bilis vomiting. It has no bile because it, bile has not been able to reach this portion of the stomach. So in these cases, surgery, myotomy, which you cut a portion of the muscle out, is actually important to allow for food to pass through efficiently. So now we'll discuss the blood supply of the stomach. So the blood supply of the stomach is pretty much only supplied by the celiac trunk. Whether it's the left and right gastric or the left and right gastropiploic, it all comes from the celiac trunk. The posterior stomach, however, receives collateral blood flow from what we call the short gastric arteries, which is off the splenic artery. The venous return of the stomach parallels the arteries. So left and right gastric veins drain into the portal system via the hepatic portal vein. 
The short gastric right and left gastroepiploic veins also drain into the portal venous system via the superior mesenteric vein. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss the anatomy of the duodenum. So the duodenum, like we mentioned before, is a very short, very small segment of the small intestines. It is a C-shaped or hook-shaped as well structure, very intimate with the pancreas, usually right around starting at L1 region. It ends at the onset of the jejunum, and it is divided into four segments. The superior, the descending, the inferior, transverse, and then the ascending portion. So the superior segment, it's continuous with the stomach and pylorus, and is the main site of attachment for the hepatoduodenal ligament of the lesser omentum. And this portion of the duodenum is considered to be partially intraperitoneal. The descending segment is probably the most significant portion. It is a retroperitoneal portion, it is in very close proximity to the pancreas, and actually is the site of entranceway into the biliary tree. It is located anterior to the kidney and posterior to the colon, and it has two orifices on the medial wall. It is the minor duodenal papilla and the major duodenal papilla. The minor duodenal papilla is the orifice for the accessory pancreatic duct, while the major duodenal papilla is the orifice beneath the minor papilla and is the site of the main pancreatic duct and the site of the majority of the pancreatic and biliary secretions. The third segment is the transverse or inferior segment. This structure is retroperitoneal. It's inferior to the head of the pancreas. It sits anterior to the IVC and aorta, but post posterior to the SMA and the superior mesenteric vein. The last section is called the ascending segment. This structure is retroperitoneal. It is the most distal segment of the duodenum and is continuous with the jejunum at the duodeno-jejunal flexure. At this portion, the very top of the fourth segment of the duodenum is where there's a structure called the ligament of treats. And it kind of looks like this. This is actually a muscle-based structure. And it's the demarcation point of where the duodenum ends and the jejunum begins. The ligament of treats is a small muscle that actually contracts and elevates the duodenum to help aid unidirectional flow of food into the jejunum. Without this structure, the flow of food contents may actually be impaired. So now we'll discuss the blood supply to the duodenum. Contrary to the stomach, where it only receives its blood from the celiac trunk, the duodenum will actually receive blood from both the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. This happens through an anastomosis called the pancreaticoduodenal arcade. The celiac artery, via the common hepatic artery to the gastroduodenal artery, to the anterior and posterior superior pancreaticoduodenal artery provides the superior portion of the duodenum. Then it's the superior mesenteric artery via the anterior and posterior inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery that provides blood to the inferior portion of the duodenum. And again, the venous return of the duodenum is parallel to the named arteries. And these also drain into the hepatic portal venous system. So now we'll discuss the, what is called the abdominal omenta. So the omenta, these are folded layers of peritoneum located in the abdominal cavity, and these create what is called the greater and lesser sacs. So the lesser omentum is a smaller sac that's kind of contained in between the liver and the stomach, and as well as involves the medial portion of the duodenum. It is bordered by the hepatoduodenal ligament, which attaches from the liver to the duodenum. The hepatoduodenal ligament actually contains the portal vein, the common bile duct, and the hepatic proper artery. During surgery, there's actually a really specific maneuver called the Pringle maneuver in which the surgeon can take his fingers or a surgical clamp and actually clamp down on the hepatoduodenal ligament to kind of stop the blood flow coming up from the portal vein and the hepatic proper artery to kind of help control blood flow to the liver in instances when there's a liver laceration. So the lesser momentum, like we mentioned, is composed of the hepatoduodenal ligament, but also the other ligament is called the hepatogastric ligament. And this attaches to the lesser curvature of the stomach and goes to the liver. This is where there's a small opening called the epipoic foramen that allows access way or entrance into the lesser omentum or the lesser sac. This pink right here is the greater sac and this blue is the lesser sac. So the only way to get inside this sac or this, this space is actually to enter in through this epipoic foramen right there. The greater omentum, which is this red area, this is an area that pretty much encompasses the majority of the abdominal cavity. It's a double folded layer of peritoneum that attaches to the greater curvature of the stomach and it descends and overlies the small intestines and transverse colon. The greater omentum overlies the greater sac and is where the majority of the colic recesses in the abdominal cavity are located and which are considered to be potential sites of fluid accumulation or even infection. So now we're going to discuss some important clinical pearls. 
When we talk about the stomach, it's hard to ignore the fact that gastric ulcers occur. Gastric ulcers pretty much occur through four common reasons that are important to note as a medical student. Whether it's helicobacter pylori infections, overuse of NSAIDs, a condition called Cushing ulcers, or a condition called curling ulcers. Helicobacter pylori can actually help predispose the stomach to what we call gastric ulcers. How do you treat those? A treatment method called triple therapy in which you do proton pump inhibitors, amoxicillin, and macrolides. NSAIDs are important because they help tamper down the inflammatory process. However, when you tamper down the inflammatory process, you also shut off prostaglandin formations. Prostaglandins help with mucus secretions and help with gastric lining protection. When NSAIDs are overused or abused, you actually will stop this mucus secretions and protection of the gastric lining. So the most theoretical way to stop this is to stop NSAIDs. The next one is called Cushing ulcers, in which you actually have individuals who have brain damage, head trauma, or actually been in prolonged hospital stays will get these gastric ulcers. So the way that oftentimes you may see in the hospital when you're on the rounds is you actually see the physicians will actually prescribe protonics or omeprazole, proton pump inhibitors to kind of prevent the possibility of these in-hospital stay gastric ulcers. The last one is when you have scalding temperatures or hot temperatures or burns in which you swallow something too hot. Logically, the best way to do is just blow on your food before you swallow so when we talk about gastric ulcers, it's also important to talk about duodenal ulcers. So duodenal ulcers commonly occur in the proximal segment or the superior segment of the duodenum due to the excessive secretion of gastric acid, whether it's because you have a rampant helicobacter pylori infection or you have extreme NSAID abuse, or even when you have things something as rare as a malignancy condition such as a gastronoma or a Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which secretes excess gastrin and resultantly excess hydrochloric acid. Why is duodenal ulcerations important? Because the duodenum is really not an, an environment that's acid friendly. It does not have the same sort of protective factors that the stomach has. And it's for that reason that posterior erosions and interior erosions may often occur in the duodenum. It's the posterior erosions that are very worrisome because it can actually lead to either perforation and damage of the gastroduodenal artery that kind of sits underneath the posterior portion of the duodenum. And if this is kind of perforated and the artery is damaged, you could actually potentially have a life threatening bleed. So now I want to discuss a little bit of the omentums as well. So what's pretty interesting, I think, is that the omentum is a very highly vascularized structure that, again, attaches from the greater curvature of the stomach and kind of descends over the top of the abdominal viscera. And the omentum kind of sits right over the top of this off the greater curvature. It's a highly vascularized structure. And sometimes, actually, they can actually use the greater omentum as a flap coverage and to cover infected sites because the greater omentum is so vascularized that it can actually help with transportation of antibiotics in a timely manner. So the last one we're going to talk about is what we call parasophageal hernia. So higher hernias are very, very common, especially with people understanding the fact that the lower esophageal sphincter may relax and, and cause laxity, and then the stomach can ride up, and you can get GERD. There's another condition called parasophageal hernia, where the fundus of the stomach or sometimes the cardia may actually ride up next to the lower esophageal sphincter into the thoracic cavity. And then this is when you can actually end up getting stomach sounds and auscultation of the lower lung fields. So it can be very concerning because you're thinking, why, why is this person having stomach sounds in their thoracic cavity? And it actually can be a sign of a parasophageal hernia. And as you can see over here in this instance, right here is the esophagus as it comes down this way. It enters through the diaphragm. Here's the stomach. And then you have a portion of the stomach kind of protrudes back up through the diaphragm. And it can cause weakening from the diaphragmatic cruise and actually have gastric contents enter up here into the lower lung fields. It may be asymptomatic, it may have no significant presence, but it's kind of interesting to think about. And you hear stomach instead of lung sounds, all right, then you may have to think parasophageal hernia may be a cause. And thank you again. That concludes this section of Da Vinci Academy.